We're in Romans 5, and this is our second class that we've been dealing with the uh, love in two ways. <clears throat> Boy. <clears throat> and we would like to finish this area, Lord willing. All right. <clears throat> so... Um, we were looking at, in the last class, we were looking at verse uh, 8 and also verse 5 and seeing the, the scriptural verses that identify love in two ways. But God, verse 8, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We related that to this God that is self-giving, selfless, that is, um, demonstrates his love by selflessness. Um, that uh, he died for his enemies. And then verse 5, but, um, but hope make it not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given unto us. And um, so we see the present, ongoing work, if you will, of the cross, but not the cross, not the work of the cross, but the spirit or the heart or the being of the cross. That's the only way I know how to put it. Uh, it is the eternalness of what was, what was eternal at the cross, you know. Um, and so um, we saw that, and my subtitle that I wanted to just read a little bit on is called it is the same love. There's no change. And there is the heat. See, we, we, we quote those scriptures in Hebrews. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we go, you know, we usually apply that to something that we don't want him to change on. You know, like keep blessing me. You know what I mean? Keep blessing me. Keep doing stuff for me or whatever. You know, don't change on this, you know. But the deal is, is that in us, Jesus is not going to be any different at the cross than he is going to be in us. <clears throat> the question is, will it be Jesus or will it be us? That's the real issue. All right, so it is the same love. God's love does not change. Whether it was demonstrated on a cross 2,000 years ago or toward a brother or sister in this present time period. Why does it never change? It never changes because we have been given the same life. The same life that died at the cross, we have that in us. It's, his name is Jesus. In fact, the next line is, it is Jesus, exclamation point. Jesus' life was given at the cross for ungodly, undeserving people, and, and then, and he responds the same way in us, if allowed, toward the unjust and undeserving of our day. The key is Jesus, and the means is allowing the love that we who are ungodly received at the saving of our soul to become givers of it and not just receivers of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. That right here, right at the cross, we'll come here and oh, we'll come on our knees and we'll say, oh, oh, beautiful Jesus, oh, beautiful Lamb of God, that you would give yourself for my sins and my transgressions and my bad attitudes and my, you know, unjust at, uh, actions towards people who don't deserve it and my, oh, thank you for doing that. But we don't want to just take that same reality from the eternal himself and apply that through us. We just want it applied to us. Oh, just save me and bless me and help me and do all this stuff for me. But that person, get them, God. See, there's no mercy. And that was, that was one of the things Jesus was trying to deal with the Pharisees. I mean, he says, you do that, you tithe mint and Jew, and julep and all this kind of stuff, and you do all these things so intricately, but you leave off mercy and justice and that, that kind of thing. And um, <clears throat> why, would, why would Jesus even... Why would he even bring that up? I mean, why would he even, why would the Son of God be so petty as to say something like that? Well, to him, it's not petty. To him, it's not petty. To him, it's either him or us, and we're in trouble if it's us. 
I don't mean it's him against us. I mean, it's, it's either his life or our life, and we're in trouble if it's our life. Because we will, we will work up, like the Pharisees, we will work up a list of things that we can do on our own and gain what by it? We will gain confidence, and we will boast in those things. Where are we at? Uh, Romans 3 and 4 again, right back there. And that's what he's trying to address in Romans 5. And he's trying to deal with all that stuff because you can still do that in Christianity. You don't have to be off over here in Judaism into being a Jew and doing all of the law in an orderly way. You can, do, you can find a list of Christian things and you can give yourself, because you know how to do that. I, I can pray and I can give some money in church and I can, you know, I can go to a building and I can, you know, read a book. And again, Buddhists do all that. It may be a different temple, a different book and da 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 da, but it's still, they're doing, I mean, you know, they're doing, if, it, if there's any virtue in doing it, then they're more virtuous than you. Or me. Not trying to point the finger, but I am trying to make a point. Because <laughs> it's not a, it's, it's all of us. So, so Paul is advancing. Romans 5 is an advancement. It's an, adva an advancement of on what Romans 3 and Romans 4 were addressing because he was still having to deal with boasting and self-confidence up till then. And now, and we, we, we haven't got to it yet, but we will. Now we're going to see, you know, in those chapters he says, where is boasting then? By the law of works? No, but by the law of faith. But here, it's not the law of anything. It's just the, his life. All right, so I'm going to read that last sentence again. The key is Jesus, and the means is allowing the love that we who are ungodly receive to the saving of our soul to become givers of it and not just receivers of it. Let us continue. <laughs> Y'all feel good. I turned, I turned a page. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Since we all know that God crucified his own son just to reconcile enemies to himself, he will continue to act in the same way and will still do that if he is in us in the present. All right. What does that mean? Well, You, you talk about unjust, just that statement. Listen to this statement and tell me if this doesn't sound unjust. God crucified his own son just to reconcile enemies to himself. Doesn't that sound unjust? But in God, in the Godhead, in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and how they operate, they are of one heart and one spirit and one mind and one way and one being. And it's not foreign. It's not foreign elements to them. I'm telling you, it's not. That's who they are. And that's how they function. So, the, you know, the father says, look, I'd like to reconcile all those guys who turned on you to me. <laughs> so I'm going to, you know, how about this? I, I send you down to the earth and they just really treat you really bad and then they kill you. And, you know. Are you up for that? And Jesus goes, will it, will it work for them? Yeah. Well, let's do it. <laughs> God is love. Sure. Yeah. But you try that, try that with your brother or sister. Hey, you know what? I think, <clears throat> you know, I'm, what I'm thinking about doing is, you know, having you put to death so that the people that have been really mean to me and you can be my best friends. Are you up for that? And you go, heck no. <laughs> no way. <clears throat> okay. But there is, there is that which would say, yes, Lord. And that is 
being conformed to the image of Christ. That is Christ in you, the hope of glory, the hope of glory, the hope of glory. Where do we hear that phrase, glory, and the hope that God would get glory? Well, yeah, okay. So, so uh, into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Romans 2. Rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And then verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed. Okay. Okay, so he's rejoicing in this hope. Listen carefully. He's rejoicing in this hope that God's going to get glory. Okay? And then he starts talking about going through all this tribulation and stuff, but coming through it in a proper spirit and way that will give God glory. But he says, we have hope for the glory of God. Now listen to this. We have hope for the glory of God, verse 5. And hope does not disappoint. Our hope does not make a shame because we got something more than hope for the glory of God. We've got the love of God, the nature of God shed abroad in our hearts whereby we can handle all of this stuff that he just mentioned in between. It's the sandwich. Hope of glory of God and uh, verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation and da 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 and and then it ends with and patience and experience and, and uh, patience, experience and experience hope and hope doesn't disappoint us because we got something greater than hope the love of God the nature, the lamb himself the living being of the thing is shed abroad in our hearts so we got more than hope we got assurance but the assurance, folks, is Christ. And it's not just Christ in heaven. Bless you. It's Christ in you. Okay. So I'm going to read that first one again that shocked us. Since we all know that God crucified his own son just to reconcile enemies to himself, he will continue to act in the same way and will still do that if he is in us in the present, all right, that's tough. Because we don't, if we don't, if we're not one with him, we're not even going to understand what he's saying. I mean, you do realize this is a different, it's not just a different language, but it is a different language. But it's also a different mindset. And it's, uh, you know, that's why I said, he said to us, let this mind, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal to God. He goes through the whole process again. But he's saying there, and he's saying here, let this self-giving, self-sacrificing one be in you. Because I'm going to need you down the road. To help me reconcile some enemies. I'm going to need you to stand ready to go to the cross. I'm going to need that. Well, we say, well, don't do it at an inopportune time, Lord. You know, I'm up for that, but keep it far enough away where I don't have to think about it. And when it does come, don't let it be where it would mess up anything that's important to me. Well, that's human nature. He died for ugly sinners. That same beautiful life now lives in us. Just as God continues to save unworthy souls, so we continue to let his love flow out of us toward believers who are unworthy of such love. Believers. Oh, well, did I say? Oh, my God. I said believers, not sinners. Just as God continues to save unworthy souls, so we continue to let his love flow out of us toward believers who are unworthy of such love. You do realize there's none worthy, no, not one. There's none, none of us. He already made that plain. See, that's the good thing. If we build five, chapter five on four, and we build four on three, and we build three on two and three on one, then what we're gonna end up with is one message. And we'll grow in the midst of it, which is 
pretty cool. We get to grow. We, but not just grow spiritually. We grow into wherein we stand. In the grace wherein we stand. And we grow up into that. And that's what it says in Colossians and Ephesians. To grow up into him in all things who is the head. That's why he's the head of the body. And to, to grow up into the head. See, everybody's trying to grow up in spiritual things. I want to learn how to pray for the sick. I want to learn how to be a missionary. I want to learn how to, to, to do this or that. All these ministry things. And we grow, we learn them all, but we never grow up into the head. So it's still us for God instead of the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. Okay, whether it is at the cross or at work in us, it is still God's love. The unchangeable, the eternal. Our only true hope for releasing it to unjust brethren is to grasp the depth of the death Jesus died for the ungodly. You're not going to fully know what you have until you see it at the cross. We didn't even know. They called him Elohim and Jehovah and all that. None of that nailed the nature of God still doesn't. Didn't. We say, well, Jesus, but you know, the Jews call him Yeshua and, and uh, the Mexicans call him Jesus. There's no other name given under heaven. Is it Jesus or Yeshua or which, which is it? To name him, to name him, to, to to know who he is. That's the goal. That's the goal. It is not merely a matter of praying that God will give us more love. Isn't that the common thing? It's just, you know, Lord, I'm just not loving enough. You know, give me more love. Y'all remember the story at Mardi Gras. We were there, and I mean, it was rank. We were on Bourbon Street. We weren't on Jackson Square. We are in the middle of Bourbon Street. Somebody stood there and peed on my leg because they couldn't get out. You can't get out. You're so tight that you're just stuck there and trying to get a group of us through there. And somebody turned to me and said, I hate that one of the group and said, I hate this place. I hate it. I, I hate the sin and the vileness of it all. And, and, and Randy, I can't show these people my love because I don't have any love for them. And I said, well, praise God. Good. Said, well, what? I said, you didn't come here to show them your love. You came here to show them Jesus' love. So it's not merely a matter of praying that God will give us more love. It is also not just that of committing ourselves to becoming more loving, a more loving Christian. That's the other thing. Well, okay, I'm going to become more loving. You know, even if you did, it's still not this. It's still not the original. It's a copy, and a copy doesn't last. You keep making a copy of a copy, and pretty soon it doesn't look anything like the original. God does not just tell us to be patient or loving like a Buddhist. His spirit of love that died for the ungodly is given to us to do the same for others. Oh, I'm not, I'm still got all this. <laughs> Don't get your hopes up. <laughs> but we're doing pretty good, actually. All right. Remember, I, I told you at a certain juncture that we would uh, talk about this boasting and confidence because it's a huge part of the. It even goes all the way to chapter one of Romans about the the confidence and boasting and and so um, so Romans is bringing Romans five is bringing us into a new level of confidence, a new level of confidence, and that confidence that we have is because. It is not in ourself. You know, 
I think throughout all our life, we will constantly be learning, number one, that we're not adequate enough. Number two, he is. The key is to get to a place where, like, you know, Jacob, I used him the, as an example in our last class. The key is to get to a place where you wrestle with God because you, you think that you got something. You know what I mean? You're wrestling with him. You know, you wouldn't wrestle with him if you didn't think you could win. <laughs> right? You just go, hey, let's not do this. I know, you know. <laughs> I mean, I've seen that in Oak Cliff a few times. You know, we used to have this drive-through place, and you'd drive around and around, and we'd be full of people out by their cars and stuff. And some, you know, one of our guys throws something at somebody, and they run in front of the car, and then his big brother comes out, and he's just humongous, you know. And you go, uh, never mind, sorry there, buddy, you know. Um, but you know, in in the Lord, we don't do that. David saw Goliath, and he went, hey, you know, same kind of spirit and attitude that uh, Caleb had. This, this is, these giants are bread for us. Bread for us. Yummy. Is that our attitude when we see a giant? <laughs> Get some bread tonight. <laughs> or is it, oh, my God, I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm not adequate. Lord, why would you put me in this situation? Be gone in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> we, we, never, we never learn that it's, it's okay to not be adequate. And like I said, I mean, I'm still there. I know we all are, but I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing that we get in situations when we go, okay, this is a new, and God's so, so creative. God. God. He knows just what we need. <laughs> and he brings it. And we, we might have been sailing on for years going, oh, this is, you know, I'm doing good. I'm, I'm really growing. I'm spiritual. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? We, we sort of get to a place where we level off and, you know, and then he brings something into our life and it's like, oh, God. Not only is it something into our life, but it's new and it's creative and it forces things that you didn't have to touch before to be brought to the surface. And if you're real with God, and if you love the Lord, then you go, okay. Okay, Lord, here we go. <laughs> Round 15. <laughs> you know. <laughs> here we go, Lord. We're going around again, only we're gonna, you're going to be dealing with new stuff in me. And not just dealing. Folks, the dealing is not spiritual. We think, well, God's dealing with me, so I'm spiritual. <laughs> you know, he deals with idiots. You know that, don't you? <laughs> I'm talking about me. But he does. That he brings you into that dealing so that things that couldn't be touched by the, the previous dealing or the dealing before that or the dealing before that, you, could, you would be confronted with and you go, okay, um, you know, I'm going to need you again. <laughs> I'm going to need you. I'm going to have to, you know, I'm going to have to go through some stuff here, but I intend on being with you. And I am not going to let these obstacles stop me from being with you, so let's do it. I mean, that's, eventually that's what I get to. I just go, okay, we're doing this. We're doing it. <laughs> and uh, he's, he's precious, but he, he doesn't slack off. Do you know that? I mean, he doesn't, you know, when it's what we need and the timing of what we need, he'll keep at you. If it can be put off, fine. But sometimes it's, Father, take this from me, but, you know, I just want you to know if it, you can't take this one away, then, then do it. Do it. Do what you got to do. <clears throat> 
All right, so prior to this, we have shown from Romans chapter 1 through 4 that man has different reasons for having confidence and for, and, uh, for which he boasts. We know that the natural man will rely upon his or her looks, cleverness, abilities, etc., to gain confidence and maintain stature among its peers. These things that give confidence are usually used in a manner to show up others, making them feel, making others feel inferior and us feel confident. I'm smarter than you implies that you are dumb, uneducated, and inferior. I'm pretty can imply not merely what I am, but that I'm prettier than you. Usually the things that give us confidence are the same things that make others feel less than you. Can I get a bigger amen than that? I kind of thought that was pretty cool because <laughs> it's right on. It's right on. You know, we're new creatures. This is a new creation. Everything's new. Behold, all things have become new. What does that mean? We go, praise God, all things are new. Well, you've got to learn a whole new set of stuff. The way of proceeding, you know, it's not just this euphoria of Christian spirituality. Oh, praise God, everything's new. It's like, oh my God, everything's new. I'm in unfamiliar territory here. <laughs> Romans 2 and on proceed forth to show that there are those who make their boast in the law. David said this in Psalm 34 too, I will make my boast in the Lord. Isn't that cool? I just want you to know there's a difference between making your boast in the law or the scriptures and making your boast in the Lord. <clears throat> and I may address that a little here. Paul does not refute the law, but he refutes those who have made personal righteousness out of keeping the law instead of seeing Christ crucified there in it. Okay, now that's a, that's, that could be a strange statement. You want me to read it again? Paul does not refute the law, but refutes those who have made personal righteousness out of keeping the law instead of seeing Christ crucified therein. Listen carefully to what he says. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But, but, get ready, but, now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested here it is, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So what I just said is they have made personal righteousness out of keeping the law instead of seeing Christ crucified, which Paul is referring to here, in the law. And he said this, this new righteousness is being witnessed by the law. That's what it was for. I like this guy, Paul. By the way, that was Romans 3, 20 and 21. <clears throat> it is at that point in Romans that the apostle begins setting forth a new basis for confidence or boasting, that of the cross of Christ. Remember, that's in chapter 3, right? The cross of Christ or the work of God on the cross. That's still not Romans 5, right? Y'all do know there's a difference, right? Okay, good for y'all. Somebody listened. <laughs> But once we arrive at Romans 5, Paul adds something. Remember, we're talking about boasting and confidence. He gives us two cases whereby we might have confidence in the Lord in relationship to his love. In the first case, we have a confidence in God and his love in general. That confidence is based on the fact that though any person fail God, fall into sin, or come short of the glory of God, yet God's love was commended toward them in that he died for them. Confidence. Confidence. But confidence in what? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Confidence in the work of God. But what, look, look at the cross. Again, what brought it into existence? The God of love. The, the God of selflessness brought that into existence. So in truth, our confidence is not in the work of God. It's in the character or the nature of God that brought it to pass. 
Okay? That's important. In the first case, we have confidence in God and in his love in general. That confidence is based on the fact that though any person fail God, because the very first chapter is about everybody failing God, and then the third chapter is about him receiving them regardless. <clears throat> this love is so strong that it extended to his worst enemies. <clears throat> and, you know, the question arises, does it does that same love, that same God that's poured out into us, does it extend to our worst enemies? The ungodly can trust that God's love will not be removed, therefore our confidence is in God and in his character. Our boast is in God who even when we were enemies made reconciliation, which is bringing enemies into intimate relationship and oneness with the life and nature of God himself. Our confidence is not in our flesh, <clears throat> but in God in a specific way. His love caused him to pour out his life for me when I was ungodly, and now that same love is in me and gives me confidence that living by his life will do the same thing toward the worst in Christianity. <clears throat> confidence. It's a confidence, and in both cases, if you take it to its core, and this is what people don't do, they, they, it's like the first thing, you know, it's like a tree. You know, you walk up and you go, oh, a pretty tree. Look, look, there's some red things hanging there, you know, apples, you know, and there, look, there's some red things hanging there. That's really nice. That's really cool, you know. <clears throat> but where did the apples come from? Well, it came from little twigs that were holding them. But where did they come from? From branches. Where'd they come from? From other branches connected to other branches that had grown more. Each branch that had grown more than the other had grown more only in this, the capacity to hold more life inside of it. I'm the vine, you're the branches. <clears throat> and therefore had the, not only the capacity to be a bigger branch, therefore not only the capacity to hold more life in it, but the capacity to let that life flow out of them to another smaller branch too, also, called the body of Christ. The way we make the body of Christ is we're all just unconnected and, hey, you know, I love you and you love me, and, you know, and it's not the same, it's not the same. <clears throat> so this, the eternal, the ever living, never not living in the sense of he lives. You know, life lives. He lives. <clears throat> he is the core. You, I was using the example of that apple tree, but you go back to it, and what started the whole thing? A little tiny seed. Bless you. A little tiny seed that, was, that died. Come on, can I get an amen on that one? That big old tree, all the fruit, all of the green, all of the brown, all of the branches, all of the fullness, all of the manifestation goes back to a seed that fell in the ground and died. That's it. Well, when you're standing there looking at that tree, like most Christians do, they, they, they pick what they like. Well, I like fruit, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to emphasize the apple. Well, I like green, so I'm going to emphasize the leaves. Well, I like things that support, so I'm going to emphasize the branches. Well, I like bugs, so I'm going to emphasize the bugs. I don't know. But, you know, we all pick our, you know, you know, our little areas, but you can't see the core. You can't see by just looking on the surface. You cannot see the cross and comprehend it by looking on the surface. 
So you say, Lord, open my eyes to things that count. Open my eyes to things that start other things. They're like, they're like creators. That's what a seed is. It's a creator. But only a dead seed. <laughs> Amen? That's what Jesus said in John 12, 24. So, so you start crying out for something that you can't see. Lord, I, you know, here's our, our statement. Well, I don't understand. Well, what we're asking for is an explanation, not understanding. Do you hear what I said? We're, I, I, I don't understand. We're not really asking for understanding. We're asking for an explanation, and, in, and particularly an explanation that will serve my mind and how it fits and what it thinks like, and so I don't have to let this mind be in me. I just have to fit it into the way I think so that it becomes like man or four-footed beast or creeping things, Creep, creepy things. <laughs> Which is, <laughs> he's laughing because he knows I'm talking about you. <laughs> Just kidding. <clears throat> but, but this, all of this, we talk about, we talk about forgiveness, you know, coming to the God. Oh, there's forgiveness. Or we talk about, you know, the euphoria of the spirit of God pouring out, you know, or we talk about, we talk about all those things, and they're all in there. They're all in there. They're, it, they're undeniable. I'm not trying to take it. You don't, you, it, it would be nothing if you took all that away. You'd just be back to what you had before God created anything. It'd just be God. But for God's sake, this, this being, I, I, I get more satisfaction of calling that than all the stuff we call him. Because I, I don't have to have a name to identify him because the name distracts me sometimes. Maybe it doesn't you, but it distracts me sometimes because it's like, okay, well now I'm worshiping Jesus and my image of what Jesus is. But when I say this being that is God and God is love, it kind of opens the door for the Holy Spirit to start writing on the chalkboard, you know, the blank chalkboard. He goes, okay, here's, here's a God explanation of who he is. See, that's the Holy Spirit. He came to give us God explanations of stuff, and we're just here and teaching. We're missing it. And, you know, again, fitting it into our theology or fitting it into, well, my mind works like this, and... God's mind is so different from me and it's confusing and da, da, da. just stop asking for explanations. No wonder it's confusing. Start crying out for understanding of him. I want to know you. You know? So, all of this happens because and flows the way it flows because in the beginning at the very beginning at the start God he didn't try to explain it in Genesis he didn't he tried. in the beginning God or John 1 1 all things were made by him so we go, yeah, trees and little animals and, oh, you know, all things from the wood, you know, it's all made by him. Oh, he's such a sweet creator. What does him being a creator like that have any, what influence does that have on you other than you get to wake up to a, another day or something, stuff? This, in the beginning, God, creator, and what it produces of all of these aspects that's on this chart on the board. And more, and more, obviously, this is nothing. You go back to the source. You go back to the source, and you say, you say, Holy Spirit, teach me the source. Teach me the being. 
the being, not the, not the teachings of the being. <laughs> I, I have experimented. I'm sure you believe that about me and my relationship with God. I said, Lord, don't teach me anything anymore. Just let me get to know you. People think I'm crazy sometimes, and so do I. I, I do. I think I must be crazy. But he responded to that. And it was special. Because it was like, Okay, hey, let's, hey, you mean we're not going to talk theology? That's kind of God's response. <laughs> Great, let's just, <laughs> you know. And then he can take the word and he can take examples like all this on the board and he can say, okay, you see this right here? This isn't something that I, that I give to you. This is me in you. This isn't something I did for you. This was the greatest manifestation of my being and what I'm like on the whole planet. And he's not teaching theology then, see? He's teaching himself. Or he's showing, he's showing himself. And that's the, that's the thing. That's what we want. That's what we want. That's what we want. All right, I got one small paragraph left. That's pretty good. But we're not done yet, so don't, yeah, don't rejoice yet. All right, the second basis of confidence is that the same love that Jesus has for me when I act ungodly. <laughs> That's right. Let's, let's go back. <laughs> the second basis of confidence is that the same love that Jesus has for me when I act ungodly is shed abroad in my own heart toward others who do the same unjust actions toward me. Should I read it again? Told you not to get too excited about being over with. This is the third time we're reading this one. The second basis of confidence is that the same love that Jesus has for me when I act ungodly is shed abroad in my own heart toward others who do the same unjust actions toward me that I did towards God. The unjust actions towards God, and he forgives they do unjust actions toward me, and instead of going, well, that's not fair. I mean, what if God did that to us, you know? Well, would you forgive me? Today? Well, this isn't fair. You shouldn't be doing this. This, this makes me mad. <laughs> like, Gee whiz, what are we dealing with here? <laughs> you know, but he's not that way. He says... I forgive you. I not only forgive you, I accept you. I bring you in as recognized in Son, by the Son, because you're in oneness with the Son. <clears throat> okay, when faced with the ungodly actions of some, I have patience and peace toward those who cause it because of his love for the ungodly that's at work in me towards them. All right. Paul says in one place, quit ye as men. Quit being like men. Quit reacting. Quit letting everything bug you. Well, I don't like this. Well, this doesn't fit me because it's not me. It's not me. <laughs> this, is, this is so uncomfortable to be around this person because they just don't, they don't roll with me. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, that's not how I roll. <laughs> So, it's just pitiful, people. It's just pitiful. But we do it all the time because me is in the center, because me is what I'm expecting the world to conform to me, you, look, or the Christians all to conform to me. Look, this is the way I am. Put me in a ministry that fits me, and, and don't, don't send anybody to work with me that doesn't fit me. You know. Well, it usually ends up be, being one person doing it then, you know, and the, and the person loves it then, because there's never any problem. I never have a problem with me. I, I'm pretty. 
I'm, I'm pretty good. You know? And that's the conclusion we come to. Wow, all these other people have problems in their ministry, but I never have any problems with mine because I'm in charge. I'm the workers. I'm this. I'm that. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So when faced with the ungodly actions of some, I have patience and peace toward those who cause it because of his love for the ungodly. And that's the key. That's what Romans 5 is trying to emphasize, folks. Jesus' love at the cross for the ungodly and that that's what was shed abroad in our hearts toward the unjust. That's what he's trying to emphasize. And we'll, we'll, you know what? We'll see it even greater next class or probably next two classes and it will be uh, salvation in two ways and it's going to be good it's going to be a tasty morsel <laughs> of reality uh, one more sentence I think he died for me as an enemy and he who lives in me will die for others who are my enemies does that make sense? And we're done here. Stick a fork in it. It's done. Father, we just thank you for your son. We thank you that he emanates and proceeded from you. And that's what he said. I proceed forth from my father. And he gives due honor and diligence to his source. It is not me that doeth the work but the Father who dwelleth in me. It is not my words, but the Father who dwelleth in me. So, Father, allow the Holy Spirit to help us to see these things in spirit and in truth and not in theology and teaching. <coughs> allow your spirit. May we allow your spirit Holy Spirit, <clears throat> I'm sorry, we're sorry for the times that we box you in and hold you back and push you off because you don't, what you're trying to say or do doesn't fit our understanding as if our understanding is omniscient and we know everything. We carry ourselves with pride. We carry ourselves in a wrong spirit. And we miss out on everything because you exalt the humble and you bring down the prideful. And so usually we're in a state of being brought down even if we don't realize it because we've lifted up our self in the sense of thinking we have something and we know something when we know nothing yet as we ought. Lord, give us that, that heart to passionately want Christ to fill us. Not just go through the motions of Christianity, but to passionately want you, Lord Jesus, to be the life, the breath, the mind, the motivation because if it's not you, we're not a body, we're just a carcass. We need you as the life, we need you to fill us in every part. We love you. We, yes, Lord, yes, Holy Spirit. Jesus, we passionately love you. Thank you for your grace and your gentle manner when we don't deserve it. We don't even recognize it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for putting up with wild kids that don't come to you and want to flow with your family spirit. Lord, we ask you to continue to bring us into all of the reality wherein we stand by grace. We ask you to do it not in our name or our goodness, but in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, Father.